Hello, wonderful, beautiful humans. This is your host, Yoshino, and you're listening to Artist Decoded. My guest today is author Natalie Goldberg, who is best known for her book, Writing Down the Bones, which has sold over a million copies and has been translated into 14 languages. She is also the author of 14 other books. Before this interview, I had the pleasure of reading a few of them. I highly recommend her 2018 memoir, Let the Whole Thundering World Come Home, which spoke about her two-year struggle battling blood cancer, or more specifically, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The book paints her suffering in a way that really questions one's own notion of our own mortality. It brings to the surface a lot of meaningful self-examinations, while simultaneously being funny, relatable, and poignant. We also talked about her latest book, Three Simple Lines, a writer's pilgrimage into the heart and homeland of haiku. She read me a few of her favorite haikus in this episode, which are rich and filled with observations on what it means to be alive. And if you're interested in writing like I am, I highly suggest her both her book, Writing Down the Bones, and the more recent card deck version of the book, it really helped me establish my own personal writing practice by giving me topics to write about when I felt stuck. And I'm savoring the book too, because you know when I'm sitting there journaling or writing a story, I open up the book and it's very easy to follow. It's only Um, Each chapter is maybe only a couple of pages. So it really stirs up different ideas for you to think about as you're in the process of becoming a writer or just doing it for your own personal pleasure. But all right, so before we begin this episode, I would love it if you all left us a review on iTunes and or Spotify. It only takes a minute or less. And it would really help get the word out about Artists Decoded to other listeners just like yourself. Also, I want to remind everyone that AD is an independently owned and operated podcast. If you would like to donate to us, you can go to our website, artistdecoded.com, click the donate link, and it will direct you to our PayPal or our Patreon page. It takes a lot of effort to put together these podcasts for you all, and we would love your support. So thank you all for tuning in. Here is my podcast interview with author Natalie Goldberg. Hope you enjoy it. So chicken and in love came out in 1979, right? And that's your first book, is that correct? Yeah, I thought it was 1980, but maybe 79, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a book of poetry. Oh, okay. Holy Cow Press. Okay, nice. Uh, and when um, it first came out, I would beg people to buy it. It was $2 each. And no, you know, people didn't buy books then, or mm. poetry. And um, now it's out of print and it costs a lot of money. I yeah. feel like I should have paid attention. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah. I was looking uh, just on, you know, various book sites to see if, uh, if I could purchase it. And it's like, there was one that was like $700 and another one that was like $400. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you, do you still have uh, copies of that? Yeah. I have about five copies. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. So I guess, I guess what I was going to ask about that. So, Basically, in 1986 is when you came out with Writing Down the Bones. Is that correct? Yeah. And you were around, if I did my calculation correctly, around 38 years old? Yeah, about that old. Yeah, about that age. Yeah. Okay. And um, so on on a different interview, I was... I heard that you said something about like when that book came out, you were afraid of success and failure, like it going either way for you. And can you run me through your state of mind during that time? And why were you afraid of it going either way for you? Well, um, 
I was I put down in that book what I really thought, felt, and saw, and um, I thought I would be made fun of, like I was as a kid, you know, put down by my father, and um, so I was scared. I was really scared, and um, but you know, then there's another part of you that always hopes it does well, but also afraid that they're going to just cremate you. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so I was afraid of success and failure. And um, also, no one has ever brought this up. But um, here I am telling everybody how to write. On what authority? No one has ever asked me on what authority. I just written that thin book of poetry, Chicken and in Love. Mm -hmm. And suddenly here I am. Um, telling everybody what to do. And actually it was very new in our society then. And the big publishers, you know, usually you just get a rejection letter. They spent their time writing long, mean letters to me because mm. it was threatening. Mm. Writing what, wait, what, what was, what was threatening exactly? I think, I think we were brought up that writing is something only special people can do and you're on the top of a mountain and all of that. And suddenly I said, everyone can write. It's a physical activity. Keep your hand moving. And really I had been practicing um, Zen with a Japanese Zen master for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the book is suffused with that. Mm. Um, you know, that, that that's really interesting. So I, I did want to ask about. Um, I'm I'm assuming the Japanese Zen master that you're referring to is Katagiri Roshi. Is that correct? Uh huh. And I found this quote. So it's kind of two parts. So I want to read the quote to you, back to you. And um, first of all, you're gonna have to tell me if you actually wrote this quote because you know there's quotes that kind of go around the internet that that it's like, did they write it? Did they not? You know. And um, so I was curious. I'll ask the question first. Uh, um, do you ever think if that book didn't hit for you at that time, like how your life would have changed? Yes, I do. And um, yeah, writing down the bones just took off. And it was very scary for me, actually. Um, in, in what way? Well, I, I wasn't really brought up to be successful. I did. And also I had this idea that um, I'm not really an artist if I'm successful. You know, I had the idea that you couldn't be successful. Yeah. And also, um, you know, I had a lot of women's writing groups and it, that was hard. They had trouble supporting me. I'd suddenly gone to another level. I wasn't just writing with them. Uh, I, you know, gotten recognized. Yeah. Women, and I think it's actually still true, don't know how to support each other in success. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks a lot about just our patriarchal values as, as a society. Yeah, right? and I think it's still that way, which I'm really sorry about. It's interesting, yeah, because just something comes to mind. You know, I've been reading a lot of um, Margaret Atwood, and I've been um, studying some of those just some interviews and things of Amy Tan and Amy Tan specifically said that because, uh, you know, her first book she that she published was incredibly successful. And she said that it's not that she changed. It's it's how people how people's attitudes change towards her. And then with Margaret Atwood, she basically said that you know, she never, she, she thought that she was going to be in Paris and just like die off a of drinking absinthe and, <laughs> and just accept her life as an artist. And, um, I just think about like that. It's just so interesting how certain things hit at a certain time and you can't really predict it. Right. And yeah. If writing down the bones came out in 1950, it would have flopped. It just met America or the U.S. right where, you know, that moment. And yeah. it really, you know, was ready for that kind of change. Mm -hmm. Because it really was a change in the way 
writing was taught and the way writing was seen. Mm. It was just very different. And it catapulted my life in a different way. Yeah. I was a public school teacher and I loved being a public school teacher. Mm. And suddenly I was out in the world in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess kind of to parlay that, so this sort of alternate reality version of yourself, right? And so back into this quote that I was going to read to you, and you said that Category Roshi says, poor artists, they suffer very much. They finish a masterpiece and they are not satisfied. They want to go on and do another. Yes, but it's better to go on and do another if you have the urge than to start drinking and become alcoholic or eat a pound of good fudge and get fat. <laughs> so I think the point that I'm trying to make with your quote is that, you know, this sort of the, 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 art, the art life, it has a lot of suffering and you can't really control the way that a career takes off because it, there's so many factors about it. And I guess what I'm curious too about is like what, you know, this kind of goes into the art of letting go and, you know, and, um, and studying Zen, I would assume, but at what point did you start studying under Katagiri Roshi and, um, and start studying Zen? I started studying with Katagiri in 1978 and I started sitting in 1974. So I sat on my own for four years. Then I moved to Minneapolis and found Katagiri. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, and I, people don't study Zen like we studied it then. He was kick ass, you know, really tough, really 5 a.m. You showed up. Yeah. How did you study Zen and how is it different? Uh, now that it was then? Well, I was with a great teacher. He mm. was a very great teacher and he was always available. And I lived six blocks away and he was there every morning at 5 a.m., whether you were or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it isn't like that now. I see. The world is so different. Um, he came straight from a monastery in Japan and plopped it down <laughs> in the middle of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and expected us to, you know, show up. You wanted to. He was a great being. You know, you mm -hmm. realize you hadn't met anyone like this mm -hmm. and that um, he walked his talk mm -hmm. and you wanted to be with him. Yeah, yeah. And so from your years of practicing Zen, I'm curious how, like what, what do you think is the main lesson that you learned through practicing Zen? Well, um, for many years, and if you read, I don't know what books of mine you've read, but I think in some book I say it, that of the years that I studied with Katagiri, I learned three things. Continue under all circumstances. Don't be tossed away. You know, like if you get criticism or whatever, you just keep going. And also make positive effort for the good. Hmm. And he told me that when I was going through a divorce and was miserable. And I told him I just couldn't get out of bed. And he said, get up and brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> A positive effort for the yeah. good. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. So those were the three things that really held me through most of my writing life. Contin and, you know, when I tell it to my students, especially white, privileged, middle class people, women, mm -hmm. it's really helped them continue under all circumstances. You're building a spine. Yeah. You show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's something to be said about that discipline, especially in a society where it's very much mm, 
predicated on the idea of rewards yeah in terms of the monetary form you know or 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 otherwise you know just some sort of reward off of the thing that you do and you know i i like what you said and i i was listening to an interview and you said that writing is a muscle and which if you i mean in terms of the physical form your corporeal form if you want to continue building your muscle you have to show up and it's a discipline like anything else it's very simple if you want to be a runner you have to run Mm -hmm. you want to diet you have to stop eating so much (laughs) yeah yeah do you know what i mean it's sort of you you just have to show up and we're not taught that in our society our society is so driven by success and monetary success. Yeah. It's empty. It's really empty. And I think our society now is caving in. Mm. And a lot of that is, is, yeah, we don't have real values. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because this, this really um, brings to mind this. um, I read this in a book and I, I brought on, this author, her name's Lydia Yuknovich, onto the podcast. And um, in, in her book, she quotes Barbara Kruger. And this Barbara Kruger piece says, uh, I shop, therefore I am. And it very much shop, talks. therefore I am. Yeah. Wow. But also it's just, you know, it speaks so highly of capitalism and our culture. And yeah, I want to write that else. down. Because my mother shopped my whole childhood till I was going to go out of my mind. That's all she <laughs> yeah. did. Yeah. And um, I shop, therefore I am. Yeah. It's a, it's a very thin value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But people, you know, I remember I found the right sweater and it was like a great victory, like an awakening, an epiphany. And, yeah. um, yeah, it's we have very thin values yeah. in our country. My partner is Chinese, and she always says to me, Natalie, why is everyone so fat? And I, and I said, well, you know, they're poor, and they eat a lot of potato chips and stuff. She said, I don't understand. She said, in China, if you're poor, you're skinny. You know, you're hungry. Yeah. Said, so, well, yeah, they are hungry, but they can fill up on a lot of junky Junk. carbohydrates. Oh, yeah. And, um, I don't know why I brought that up, but uh, yeah, we, yeah, we don't stay down to the to the bottom. Mm-hmm. You know, like for her, logically, if you're poor, you're hungry, therefore you're skinny. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think you brought that up probably because of just the way that food is viewed in our society and you know it's it's easily accessible to be able to go to mcdonald's for instance as opposed well maybe not now mcdonald's seems like it's it's pretty expensive now but uh the the idea of a fast food entity um you can get something for a dollar as opposed to maybe going to the grocery store and getting like i don't know some fruits and vegetables you know yeah yeah. People are much more incentivized to follow their taste buds in that way, as opposed to maybe something that's more healthy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And more nutritious in a deep way. And mm. uh, and yet, oddly enough, there are people that are really starving in the U.S., you know, yeah. that have poverty and are really starving. Well, I now, mean, uh-huh. but it's also spiritual starving. Well, that's, yeah, that's the, no, yeah, that, 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 that's exactly uh, the sort of uh, the, the, the tie in there, I think is this, um, you know, speaking of values and speaking of starving and that could be, you know, on the mental sense in terms of just consuming everything as opposed to trying to find meaning out of life. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said about that. And I guess like, so I did read, um, just going back to your books, I did read Let the Whole Thundering World Come Home. This is beautiful. I really, I really, really enjoyed it. And I like what you said 
Yeah. And I like what you said in the interview. I think you were saying something to the effect that, you know, it was a very lonely process for you to need the information about how to treat your, um, I believe it was, you had blood cancer, right? Is that a chronic yeah. Yeah. Lymphos- lymphocytic leukemia? That- CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Yeah, exactly. And so like, I guess, you know, what I'm trying to get out there in terms of this, uh, and this loneliness, but I guess, but like through writing that book and through go- undergoing treatment, what sorts of things helped you prepare for that in terms of, you know, your discipline and practice as a writer, or was it Zen? Like what, what helped you prepare? Well, I, I wrote while I, I wrote while I, I wrote the great spring, which came out right before the book you mentioned. And I wrote that while I had cancer. Mm. Cause suddenly I wasn't busy and, Besides going for treatments, I had space. And, you know, I've written all along, so why wouldn't I keep writing? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, even though you have cancer, you brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. So even though I had cancer, I kept writing. And um, it was a very wonderful time, actually, in my life. I love The Great Spring. I'm very proud of that book. And um, I had the pleasure of space and time to write it while I had cancer. As soon as I found out that I was going to survive, then I wrote the book you read. Mm. So really I I had two books out of the cancer, but so that prepared me is the practice of writing. And then also Mm -hmm. cancer was never my enemy. Mm. And that might be from my Zen mind. It was never my enemy. And I think I say in the book, that um, at one point, cancer, um, I I had uh, CLL, so they're in my lymphs, and I was going to take a drug that supposedly would destroy them. And I said to them, get out now. We're old friends, we've been friends, get out now because I'm gonna take something that's gonna destroy you. So if you can, get out now. But I never felt that it was my enemy. You know, everything needs to survive. Cancer was feeding on me. Do you think that, so just um, the saying that has kind of been resounding for me the past, I don't know, year or so, is this idea that this thing that happened is for you as opposed to happening to you? Does that resonate? Are we talking about COVID? Oh, no, 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 no. I meant, I mean, just, just suffering in general. So this thing that happened, that, that happened, it happened for you as opposed to happening to you as if you were a victim. No, I wouldn't get that romantic about it. I'm not romantic about cancer. It was hard and I faced into it, but um, Mm. there's always suffering. Even Mm. if you think you're not suffering, you're suffering. Mm. It's part of, of human nature. Yeah. Do you deal with the suffering? How do you face it? How do you have a relationship with it? How do you not fight it? How do you meet it? Yeah. And, and how, how has, okay. So not even just Zen, but how have all of your life experiences that have accumulated, um, I suppose, transformed this idea of suffering to you? Well, I think I know there is suffering. Do you know what I mean? Lots of people don't know there's suffering. That there's human, the basic human life, there's suffering. And then there's old age um, and death. Yeah. Sickness and death. And people are so surprised when they get sick, including me. And I have to remind myself. Um, That these are natural human things. Yeah. We're always running ahead of ourselves, trying to get out of it. But um, everyone suffers. Yeah. Things are always changing. You can't hold on. Mm. And believe me, I'd like to. 
<laughs> yeah, I I can understand that. Yeah, there's two books that I think have been very profound for me in terms of this idea of suffering. One is uh, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking. And the other one is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. I'm sure you've read oh, both. Yeah. yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I guess, um, so, you know, going into, back into writing down the bones, um, the deck that I have right here, um, I, I'm curious, do you, do you often think of legacy, the idea of that? Um, I didn't when I was younger, but I think I do some now in that I'd like to know that when I leave that I've, I've helped people. Hmm. And I also think of writing practice as so powerful. I want people to know about it. It's such a powerful tool, hmm. whether you're a Zen person or not. Yeah. You know, going kind of back, you know, before you started publish, you know, having your books published and stuff, what exactly drew you to writing? I, um, I read Carson McCullers, A Ballad of a Sad Cafe in ninth grade. And I never got over it. Hmm. And do you know Carson McCullers? He's a, she's a Southern writer. I'm not familiar with that book. Can you um, maybe give some context? Um, well, it's a short book. And it's about the lover and the beloved. But what I saw in the book was oh, a powerful woman who is 6'2 or 6'3 and wild and just a powerful woman which I think it's the only book by a woman that I read in all of high school. And um, so that woke me up. And also, I didn't have much of a relationship with my parents. I didn't talk much. I was pretty silent. But there's all these things I thought and felt and saw and wanted to express. So I think that drew me to writing, too. Mm. And I, I, I love... I heard you say this in another interview. You said writing closes the gap between who you think you are and who you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. And, and we walk around with ideas of who we think we are, but writing and connecting with your real mind below discursive thinking, you, you realize you're nobody. <laughs> yeah. Even though you have all these great thoughts and stuff, they run through you, but they're not you. What happens is writing does writing and you get out of the way. That's when the writing is good and that's when you feel good. Yeah. So given given that 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 statement and just this train of thought, but what do you think that writing has revealed to you about yourself? That maybe the first thing that comes up to your to your mind is that I don't exist, you know, that I don't really exist. And that also it's revealed how much we live in discursive thinking, yada, 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 yada. And about being just present. I'm thinking of um, after Katagiri died, I went to study with Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, the mm-hmm. Vietnamese Buddhist monk mm-hmm. in Plum Village in France. And only I, I studied with him for six years, but Katagiri was my real, you know, I met Katagiri. But Thich Nhat Hanh recently dr- died, and I read a quote by him that I've really been carrying. And um, I, okay, uh, mm-hmm. make this moment an occasion to live deeply, happily in peace. I'm going to read it again, um, recite it again. Make this moment an occasion to live deeply, happily in peace. Mm. And the deeply covers, you know, how awful the country is, how much suffering there is. So living deeply, not being deluded. Yeah. At the same time, meet life happily and in peace. Yeah. 
And I mean, I think, I mean, that's a beautiful, beautiful quote. And perhaps if we can remind ourselves of that train of thought at every moment, we may live a completely different life, you know, I think. When I broke my finger uh-huh. um, a month ago, I was in the emergency room and I kept repeating that to myself. It doesn't mean only when you have an ice cream cone. It means every moment. Yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what. I, yeah, no, I, 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 that resonates for sure. And yeah. I think I think it's just um, you know speaking of this sort of discursive thinking, it's hard. I believe, you know, I, I'm in a the millennial the millennial generation, so I'm right there in the in the middle of where um, social media like started, and but I also remember when it we didn't have social media, you know, when I was a kid and. And, and, and whatnot, but, you know, because of perhaps, you know, the advent of these various technologies that were supposed to help humanity, and now they've created even more pathways for discursive thinking. Um, I think it's hard for a lot of people. I'm sorry, what? And suffering. And suffering. Yeah. yeah. I mean, something that just comes to mind in terms of that is, uh, I forget who said this quote, but um, let me think. Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is the what? The thief of joy. Uh huh. But then there's so many access points for comparison, you know. Uh-huh. Um, How do you feel about the internet? <laughs> oh man. How do I feel about it? Um. I think my mind goes to this more dystopic future world thinking like the sci-fi world that has been uh, we've been careening towards, you know, for, you know, things that perhaps like Philip K. Dick wrote about and um, other artists within like the sci-fi genre. Um, But the internet as a whole, I feel like Pandora is out of the box and we can't put it back. So, what do you do with that? And then I guess the, yeah, I guess the question that I, I think is what do we do about that and how do we still find peace within our lives given all these external circumstances? Right. So it's brings me back to the ideas of the Stoics and, you know, it's you're only in control of yourself. Right. So what do you think about it? I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I miss being with people when I teach. I like when there's human beings. And um, I like to be able to tell you how to get to my house, tell you about the cottonwood on the corner, and you make a left. But nobody, you know, you just do the stupid, whatever it is, Google, and everybody, they think that you can know everything. Yeah. And it gives you an idea of um yeah that you could know things you don't know when you're going to die no you no know, you don't know real things and yeah. it gives you an illusion and um it yeah. really takes you away from the ground mm-hmm. from the ground of being mm-hmm. and so um i i see that it's useful but I could really live without it. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that I've developed as a writer is antithetical. You know, I was, it doesn't even tell you if you take a a trip, a cross country trip, when you get from one state to the other. Mm -hmm. It's so wonderful to look at a map, you know, that it's just people have drank the Kool-Aid. And just believe in it totally. And it's ridiculous. Yeah. I know it's useful, but to believe in it the way you do. And every place I go, they can reach me from the phone. There's mm-hmm. no peace. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I, I don't like it. And I yeah. don't use it very much. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I was reading this book. Um, I don't know if you've read. Have you read this book, 2030? No, it's essentially, I mean, it's a, it's a, like a, 
nonfiction, speculative, speculative nonfiction, I guess, book of where, you know, this author, um, his name's Moro Guyen, I think. And he teaches at the Wharton School uh-huh. and um, of business. And basically, uh, in that book, he says that millennials are the most narcissistic generation. And I can understand why, um, because, and perhaps it, it has a lot to do with the internet and the access of information and the access of having social interactions virtually and things, you know, even like I was thinking about dating apps a long time ago or not a long time ago, maybe a couple of years ago. Right. And I was thinking about this idea of dating apps and, you know, it's just thinking about it. It's like transactional, it's expendable. Right. So you're swiping, right. And you're only judging people on the way they look. Right. And you're doing it in such a quick manner that you, there's no connection, first of all. And when you do connect, it's like, um, it's this weird transactional thing. And speaking about the narcissism, things only work if they fit in a particular way into, into a person's yeah. life. Right. Your worldview. Yeah. Exactly. And so, I don't know exactly where I'm going going here, but we're just talking about like the internet and I'm just kind of um, speaking of the ramifications of these things perhaps. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do want to take it back to your deck, you know, right, the writing down the bones deck. And so like, what, what, what do you want people to get out of this deck? Oh, well, you know, writing down bones came out and it was very successful I don't know if they've noticed, I never put out notebooks, writing down the bones notebooks or T-shirts, or I just left it. And then very recently, my concern about people not reading and writing, I had this idea of doing cards. So you would get a topic and write. And then also on the back side of the topic, I explain more deeply how the topic came about. So I'm in a way I'm sort of trying to meet people that don't read books. And I thought, well, maybe cards will help them. I think, I think they're very helpful. Yeah. Good, good. And I think that um, they did a beautiful job. Shambhala did a gorgeous job on Mm -hmm. them. I never expected them to be that nice. Yeah. um, I just did it as another here, try this as another thing to help in yeah. the world of writing. Yeah. Because it's hard. It's hard to be a writer and it's hard to be a writer now. Mm. And to trust your own mind. Mm. Do you think that, I mean, I don't want to go too much into this idea of the internet and stuff, but do you think because of all these quote unquote technological advances that it's much harder for people to trust their own minds. Oh yeah. And, and much more scattered. It's hard to just stay still and go deep, including me, you know, I'm doing an email and first of all, you answer emails quickly. You know, sometimes someone will write me the most beautiful email Mm -hmm. and I'll read it and think, Oh, that's nice. I go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And um, you don't, you lose yourself. I forget the book. I think it was uh, The True Secret of Writing. I was on a big book tour and I saw lots of friends and they all loved the book. And, you know, I got emails from everyone. Deborah Santana, who was, used to be a student of mine, wrote me a card about the book. I'll never forget that. I read it. I enjoyed it. I believed her. I remember it. I don't remember anyone else what they said. And people said beautiful things. It's harder to take in. The world gets very fast. And, um, you know, I answer quickly. Someone writes me they have cancer. 
oh, I'm so sorry. I hope you feel better. And I go on. I don't take in the world, take in my life. Yeah. It's too quick. And you have an idea that you can get answers to everything. Mm -hmm. And they're just, it, that isn't true. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. Yeah. And also, it doesn't allow time just to wonder. Like, you know, huh, I wonder what kind of tree that is. I don't want to have the answer. I want to wonder about it. I want space for me and the tree. Mm. So, so immediately I get the name of it. It's gone. Mm. It's, it's about having a, a bigger relationship with things that you can't get. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like, I like that. And, you know, you were speaking about that in um, the writing down the bones book about how, instead of saying tree, be more specific and say exactly what that tree is. And, you know, and it also uh, deepens your understanding of just your a relationship with the environment. And also something that comes to mind too is, your book on haikus, you said something to the effect of how haiku allows us to take our human experience out of, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but um, I believe it was how nature or like a frog observes something. So it's like, it's and not about it's our- It's not always self-centered. It's not always centered around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that, that a haiku, you have to step outside yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also it's a deep, to write a haiku is some deep acceptance. I'll give you an example. Shiki, who was one of the great Japanese haiku writers who died in 1902, but he had TB all his life. And at 13, he coughed up his fir first blood. So all his life, he knew he was going to die. And he was in a lot of pain. But he kept practicing haiku, kept writing haiku. And the last five years, he was bed bound. And he couldn't get up. But he would drag himself every day across the tatami to the edge of his room and look out at the garden and wait for a haiku to come, mm. to receive a haiku, not go after one. Mm -hmm. And this is a beautiful haiku if you know his life. I go, you stay, two autumns. I go, you stay, two autumns. I mean, it's a beautiful haiku anyway, but to understand that he died in his early 30s and that he understood that he was going to leave, you were probably going to stay, two different experiences of autumn. Can you say it one more time now that you've given me that context? Okay. Mm -hmm. you, I go, you stay, two autumns. Mm. Beautiful, huh? It is beautiful. Yeah, it's incre incredibly beautiful, especially with having some sort of context as to why he wrote that. So he's essentially talking about his passing away yeah. in two autumns. No, in autumn, but you two, two di different autumns. He's saying, I go now, Yoshina stays. Two autumns, oh, two I see. separate experiences of autumn. Hmm. You want me to give you another one? I want, yeah, please, please, okay. please, please. I want to, I want to, uh, I want, I want, I want to. This is the killer I, one. Uh -huh. This is Chua, Chi, Chioni. I, it, it wasn't easy to find translations of women haiku writers, hmm. but this was Chioni, who was a wonderful haiku writer, a woman. And uh, now this one, you pay attention. <laughs> it knocked me out. She'd had, I think it was, she wrote it after an opening experience. 
Do you know what an opening experience is? No, I don't actually. What is oh, that? That's what I'm afraid. Your generation. An opening means ah, mm. realize something. You mean like a, a epiphany or a trans a moment of yeah, transcendence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. I see. I understand. Okay. 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 So um, she had one of those, and let me let me go over it in my head first. Mm-hmm. Okay, ready? Clear water, no front, no back. Mm -hmm. Clear water, no front, no back. That's a good one. Beautiful, isn't it? That's a beautiful one. Yeah. Clear water, no front, no back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's like a uh, Zen koan a bit, isn't it? It's a little bit. And yet haiku is haiku. Koans are koans. True. Kind of strict about that. But um, Mm. yeah, but Japanese, well, haiku is really a great thing. And um, it's interesting. It's the last book I wrote so far called Three Simple Lines. And people have really loved it, I think, because people are hungry for something real again. Mm -hmm. You can't write a, well, you can. They have a whole thing of how you can write a haiku on the internet. Mm -hmm. Put a season, do this, do that. (laughs) But, you know, to write a real haiku is to really be present and to pay attention and to practice. Yeah. And they're right here. They're all over the place. We just have to see them. And the internet isn't going to give it to you. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good metaphor for a lot of things, right? Like being, yeah. being present and just noticing very simple things and uh, not trying to find the formula to create the thing. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, um, Natalie, seriously, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Um, thank you. you thank doing you. this. It, it, frankly, it's fun for me to talk to a millen- millennium. Just, you know, to just like what's happening with all of you, <laughs> you know, and does yeah. writing down the bones still work? Can it you- does. Good. Good. It, it really does. Actually, you know, I've been, um, well, I've been using this as a, as a practice. But oh, then- great. That makes me happy. Yeah. And, and I also, I, I like have, um, you know, some friends come over and we do it together, but then also the, the original book, I've been savoring it because sometimes when I'm there writing and I get stuck a little bit, then I'll read a chapter. And then, so I've been going through slowly and digesting. Good, that makes me happy. That makes yeah. me happy. I know we're not allowed to ask things like this, but Yoshino, are you Japanese descent or what? I'm, yeah, I'm I'm a hundred percent Japanese American. I'm fourth generation. Wow. Uh-huh. And um of the last of my kind. No, it's kidding. <laughs> but 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 it's rare. I think it's rare to find a hundred percent Japanese American person in the US. Yeah, I think so. And fourth generation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um I actually do have one que- one more question before okay. we go. Um okay. What sort of advice do you have for artists and creatives? Don't be afraid of loneliness. It's natural. Everyone has to face loneliness. I like that. 